an attempt to recreate the magic of a bygone era using the same marketing tools honed by age and experience. Still a show about talking animal people, but with more drama and storytelling sophistication. Beloved by viewers, betrayed by the very system it swore to perpetuate. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of Thundercats. Thank you to 80stees.com for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below and use code TOYGALAXY to get 30% off your order today. 80stees.com started off as the source for t-shirts inspired by all things pop culture from the 1980s, but there's more to the 80s than just the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 70s, the decade that paved the way for the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 90s, the decade that carried on the legacy of the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 2000s, because the 80s isn't just a decade, it's a state of mind. Whether your interests are laser focused on one thing, say movies, there's plenty of choices from Jaws to Shaun of the Dead. If your interests bounce around, they've got shirts from cartoons to video games, superheroes to music and wrestling. From Transformers to Dungeons and Dragons, Gollum to Ron Burgundy, Darkwing Duck to Powerpuff Girls, you'll find something you love. Click the link below and use code TOYGALAXY for 30% off your order today. Again, that's code TOYGALAXY for 30% off your order. Thanks again to 80stees.com. Thundercats is an animated series that aired 26 episodes on Cartoon Network from July of 2011 to June of 2012. It's a reboot slash reimagining of the 80s series that attempts to mature the franchise to the same degree that television storytelling, animation, and the target audience matured in the 22 years since the original series ended. Thundercats for sophisticated adults like me. Somewhere in the depths of space is a planet called Third Earth, home to the kingdom of Thundera, ruled by Claudus, wise and powerful king of the Thundercats, wielder of the Sword of Omens, father to Prince Lionel and his adopted brother, Prince Tigra. It is Claudus and the Sword of Omens that have helped maintain peace throughout the realm and between species for ages. For Third Earth is inhabited by a diverse range of creatures, from cat people to lizard people, elephant people to bird people, sentient plants, giant octopus monsters, and undead zombie wizards. But the order of things is turned upside down as the advanced technology of the Lizard Army held at bay for years attacks Thundera led by Mumra and his evil magic, ready to begin anew his quest to possess not just the Sword of Omens itself, but the jewel that rests within it. That jewel, the Eye of Thundera, the thing that gives the sword its power, is actually a magical stone, one of four that Mumra previously sought and nearly collected together in his gauntlet of unlimited, some would say infinite, power. The Thundercats who survived the destruction of Thundera, led by the young Prince Lionel, now in possession of the Sword of Omens, must seek out the Book of Omens if they're to find the Stones of Power before Mumra can. It's their only hope to reunite the species of Third Earth against Mumra and prevent him from becoming the most powerful being in the universe. The original Thundercats series aired 130 episodes over four seasons from 1985 to 1989. It is one of the cornerstone franchises of peak 1980s unregulated direct marketing to kids. Cartoons made to sell stuff to those kids beyond the 22 minutes of entertainment itself. Toys, comic books, clothing, lunchboxes, board games, costumes, bedsheets, but mostly toys. Usually developed in partnership with a toy company to keep the stories on track with introducing the new toys to showcase in the cartoons. In this case, LJN supplied the toys while Rankin Bass developed the cartoon. All I knew, all the kids knew, watching it at the time was that it was awesome. And the marketing synergy felt pretty natural to me. To them to us. Of course we wanted cool toys of the cool show we just watched. It was cool. Call it genius, call it malicious, call it predatory, call it capitalism, because that's business 101, baby. But it's the sales of the toys that are the lifeblood of the TV series. If the kids have moved on from the toys, then the show's services are no longer required. Thundercats was replaced by some other show selling some other toys headed into the 1990s. That said, Thundercats mythology left an indelible mark on those kids who, as they grew older, hungered for more adventures with the Thundercats, and wondered what a new Thundercats series could be if it was directed at them now that they were teens instead of five to eight year olds. It's arrested development. And then later, continuing to think those same thoughts as we, they, grew into their 20s, watching as He-Man and the Masters of the Universe realized that very dream in 2002 with a new, darker, dramatic, more epic reimagining of the franchise. With the slick animation and dramatic storytelling of animated series that were being released in Japan, a country that seemed to take this sort of thing much more seriously. A new He-Man series complete with new He-Man toys and comics and clothes and bedsheets. 
As Thundercats fans moved into their 30s, they watched as G.I. Joe did the same thing with a one-two punch in 2009, the big-budget feature film with stars like Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Marlon Wayans, and Christopher Eccleston in Rise of Cobra. And that same year, G.I. Joe Resolute, a series of animated shorts on Adult Swim that, when assembled together, made an hour-long film distilling the entire oeuvre of G.I. Joe while simultaneously updating everything for the new millennium. With cinematic direction and pacing, adult themes, major character deaths, Snake Eyes absolutely murdering Cobra troopers, and of course, toys and related merchandise to support the launch of both the movie and the animation. In 2010, Hasbro committed to the full renaissance of the 80s with Michael Bay's Transformers, the epitome of reboot, rebirth, reimagining with a big budget, top tier visual effects, and all the supporting merchandise. This, this is all Thundercats fans were asking for, all they could have dreamed of for themselves. Warner Brothers acquired the Thundercats as part of their purchase of Lorimar Telepictures in 1989. In 2010, they moved to capitalize on this 80s resurgence, tapping Michael Jelinek and Ethan Spaulding to develop a new Thundercats animated series that would, of course, be supported by new toys, comics, and associated merchandise. Jelinek was a storyboard artist, writer, director, and producer who had worked on films like 2005's The Batman vs. Dracula and 2009's Wonder Woman, series like Men in Black, Jackie Chan Adventures, The Batman, and Ben 10. Spaulding was a storyboard artist, character designer, director, and producer who had worked on movies like 2009's Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, First Flight, and Superman, Batman, Public Enemies, series like Avatar, The Last Airbender, and Batman, The Brave and the Bold. Their job was to thread the needle between appealing to the fans of the original series who were in their 30s and also attempt to bring in a new generation of Thundercats fans as that is where the future of the franchise would be cultivated. Thundercats was developed for Cartoon Network. Jelinek and Spaulding worked to find a balance between staying true to the original series while digging deeper into the lore and adding new layers of tension, new sources of conflict, and new motivations for characters that were now pushing 40 years old themselves. The team working on Thundercats planned a three-chapter epic that would carry the series through multiple seasons with arcs spanning 13 episode batches, making it easier to break them into seasons or half seasons. Efforts were made to incorporate familiar plots from the original series where appropriate, like The Trials of lion -O. de la galleta que va más allá de lo evidente. ¡Galletas Thundercats! Sí, las galletas del augurio con el poder de los Thundercats y todo el sabor de Phoenix. ¡Chicas, crocantes! ¡Y llenas de energía! Busca la señal de Phoenix en las nuevas galletas Thundercats, la galleta del augurio. Animation for the series was developed by Warner Brothers in a partnership with Japanese animation studio Studio Yondo Shi. They had been producing animation since 1986 with a portfolio that included films like 2008's Batman Gotham Knight and a segment in 2003's The Animatrix, series like Macross 7, and a bunch of commercials, shorts, and video games. The artists at Warner Brothers would kick off the process with basic character designs and concepts. Studio Yondo Shi would push and refine those designs to give them a modern anime flavor because What's the best way to say this? It looked really cool. The cast of Thundercats was almost entirely newcomers to the franchise, but still full of top-tier performers. Original Lion-O actor Larry Kenny returned to Third Earth, this time in the role of lion -O's father, King Claudus. lion -O was voiced by Will Friedel. Other notable cast members include Kevin Michael Richardson as Panthro, Clancy Brown as Groon, D. Bradley Baker as Slythe and Kanar, Michael McKeon as Voltaire. Kevin Kleisch added a cinematic flavor to the series' music, including pieces of the original theme itself, tipping his hat in the process to composers like John Williams, James Horner, and Jerry Goldsmith, despite a full opening animation and theme song being noticeably, egregiously absent. According to Kleisch, quote, When I got hired to score the series, the producers had one word in mind for the music, epic. They wanted the score to have the same emotional impact as the music The Lord of the Rings provided. The producers wanted each episode to stand on its own as a mini-movie. Thundercats aired at 8.30 p.m. Friday nights on Cartoon Network, premiering with around 2.4 million viewers and overall very positive reviews. Viewers seemed generally pleased with the degree to which the new series was true to the source material and generally accepting of the changes and looking forward to the potential future threads being developed. That said, some reviewers felt like the one thing Thundercats should have left in the 80s was the obvious attempt to tie the characters in conflict to the various action figures and accessories. Variety magazine criticized the series as a marketing ploy for a new Thundercats toy line. They said it represented a throwback to the drearily toy-driven 1980s, a period that seems destined to keep returning as much out of pragmatism as nostalgia. I mean, yeah, that's the point. It's Arrested Development. Despite a healthy fan base of regular viewers, Thundercats aired its initial order of 26 episodes and then 
did not come back. With no regard to where the series ended narratively, all the questions remaining unanswered a literal incomplete story. Cartoon Network chose not to renew for a second season. Two years later in 2013, co-creator Jelinek believed that the show was still on hiatus, while art director Dan Norton expressed that it was unlikely any further episodes would be produced. According to Norton, the show was pulling 1.5 to 1.7 million people on average, 2.5 million at peak. The show did pretty good, however, ratings didn't transfer to merchandise sales. An indicator that, perhaps, adults were tuning in to watch the show, but kids were not. Many believe that the show was cancelled due to the disappointing toy sales, and that is one factor which we will come back to in a moment. An argument can be made that the strategy for the Thundercats relaunch both intentionally and unintentionally split the demographics. Warner Brothers produced a show for an older audience, Cartoon Network scheduled it at a time when that same older audience would be watching, but the toys were aimed at a younger audience, as if the three sides of the production had not coordinated with each other. Or perhaps it was a deliberate attempt by Warner Brothers and Bandai to capitalize on both generations of the viewing audience, the kids who grew up with the Thundercats and the kids who were just being introduced to it. Bandai released a range of action figures for the new series. Wave 1 included all of the Thundercats and Mumra. Wave 2 featured Lionel and Panthro from Wave 1 with new portraits as well as beefed up monster mode Mumra and Lionel's dad, King Claudus. The 4-inch figures featured a built-in Thunderlink system, a magnet inside the figure used to activate special features of vehicles and playsets, from the accessories included with the deluxe figure to the Thunder Tank and a full Tower of Omens. Bandai released multi-figure packs and a 12-inch Armor of Omens, as well as roleplay items like the Claw Shield and the Sword of Omens. To be clear, these were kid-sized roleplay items. Bandai also released a smaller assortment of larger 6-inch figures based on the new series with more detail and posability aimed at collectors, lion o Mumra, Panthro, Chitara, and Tigra, and a partner line of 6-inch figures based on the original Thundercats designs. In fact, Bandai also released 8-inch collector figures based on the classic Thundercats designs, while Mezco released 14-inch mega-scale figures, a licensing push that celebrated nostalgia for the original series while shifting into the new era of the franchise. A Thundercats game was released for the Nintendo DS, Panini released 11 issues of a Thundercats comic magazine in the UK, La La Land Records released a two-disc set with the soundtrack for nearly every episode of the series, as well as the new short theme. If you missed this version of Thundercats the first time around, it was released on Blu-ray in 2014, and as of this video, you can watch the entire series on Hulu. In an interview from 2017, Dan Norton laid out what actually happened, why the series was actually cancelled. Yes, ratings were good, no, toy sales were not good enough, but there's more to it than that. At the end of the day, between how things were marketed, you know, there were a lot of parts in play between visibility, toy sales, all the stuff that Warner Brothers would want to track, you know, for licensing and marketing and all this kind of stuff. And animation is challenging. So at the end of the day, we weren't getting the airtime. We weren't getting stuff. And there was a there was a big Lego deal in the works. See. Lego was working a deal with Warner Brothers at the time. Perhaps you saw 2014's The Lego Movie and all of the associated merchandise, a huge win for both Warner Brothers and Lego. As the team behind Thundercats got to work on season two, their fate hinged on that deal with Lego. According to Norton, to Lego's credit, they did want to produce Thundercats Lego sets based on the 2011 series and the original series. However, at the end of the day, the final agreement with Warner Brothers did not include the Thundercats property. At that point, Warner Brothers and Cartoon Network let Lego hang on to everything they had developed for Thundercats and furthermore, let them rebrand and remarket it as their own property. Surprise! This isn't the history of Thundercats anymore. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of Lego Legends of Chima. Lego Legends of Chima was a Lego theme that ran from 2013 to 2015, now a side brand developed by Lego to capitalize on their already successful Ninjago line. It was supported by a CG animated series on Cartoon Network. That series focused on the fantastic world of Chima, wherein the various warring tribes of anthropomorphic animals battle over a substance called Chi, the crocodile tribe led by young Prince Cragger pit against his former friend Prince Laval of the Lion Tribe. Son of King Lagravis, Laval is an accomplished speed or racer, with spiky red hair, clothing, and armor adorned with the Lion Tribe crest, wielding a mighty sword in an attempt to prove his worth as a leader and unite the tribes of Chima. <laughs> Norton stated that once Legends of Chima came out, the Thundercats team knew they were done. Thundercats could not return. As he put it, there was no way because it felt so borrowed. You can't take it from a serious thing to be a kid thing and then try and reboot a franchise. 
In the years following the end of the series, details about the rest of the Thundercats plot have come out, how it would have dealt with the origins of the Snarfs, the fate of the Sword of Omens, the names of all the stones, cold comfort to fans that had the Thundercat rug pulled out from beneath them after decades of waiting, then briefly seeing their dream realized. Fans would have to wait nearly an entire decade for Warner Brothers and Cartoon Network to take another shot at rebooting Thundercats. Thundercats Roar was a series of 52 11-minute shorts that took the franchise in a much lighter direction than the 2011 series, and we're moving on! Thundercats in 2011 was an attempt to deliver a show that reflected not just the history and heritage of the original series, but the maturation of the concepts, characters, and fans of the show. It was as if the epic scope and drama of the adventures you had imagined as a kid were brought to the screen with the visual flair and reverence those memories deserved. We hear in the future, know that very few of the 80s reboots during the 2000s resurgence lasted more than a year or two, the Michael Bay era of Transformers being the exception. Masters of the Universe and G.I. Joe have rebooted multiple times over the course of the 20 years since. Each time, each property trying to walk the line between which generation it caters to, and in nearly every instance, failing to resolve that question before entering production of toys, cartoons, and movies, or believing that this time they can actually engage everyone, thinking that if Star Wars can do it, they can too. Born from a time when the rules of the game weren't as clearly spelled out as they had been in the 80s, a challenge faced by legacy brands whose value year over year declined as the 80s diminished further into memory. It's arrested development. It is possible that the window for a modern dramatic Thundercats reimagining has passed, that 2011 and its unresolved story are, ironically, the final chapter in what Thundercats could have been. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, if you would like early access to the videos ad-free as well as behind-the-scenes features, sneak peeks at upcoming projects, and exclusive monthly podcasts about the show, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy and let us know in the comments down below if you were a fan of Thundercats before the 2011 series or if you only discovered it because of the 2011 series. I would love to know what the breakdown on that is and if it actually turned people onto the franchise for the first time. Or if you grew up with the series, did this series make you look at Thundercats in a more positive way. I really enjoyed this series right up to the part where Panthro got his Mr. Fantastic arms and just could not get back into it after that. Interest dropped right off the table. Toughest dude in the series got turned into a wacky waving inflatable arm flailing tube man. <laughs> well, that wasn't for me. <laughs> <laughs>